This is the company of Whiting Petroleum. It is a hydrocarbon exploration company that was founded in Denver, Colorado in 1980. And over the last 40 years, the company has made its money through oil production, oil exploration, and real estate as well. And from the year 2005 up until the year 2015, the company was extremely successful as it made billions of dollars in profits before going through some financial troubles in 2015 and finally getting back on its financial feet in 2018. But then something changed. You see, when the Saudi-Russian oil war started earlier this year, and when the lockdowns significantly cut global oil demand, oil prices plummeted across the world, which in turn has made many large oil companies creep towards the brink of bankruptcy. And because of this, the Whiting Petroleum Company recently announced a $3 billion loss thus far in 2020 alone. Now this five month downturn combined with billions of dollars in debt that they have compiled over the last several years has forced the company to declare chapter 11 bankruptcy. Now, Chapter 11 bankruptcy is quite complex, but to summarize, it generally involves courts and banks renegotiating the terms of a company's debts. It also usually involves forcing the company to lay off a large portion of its workforce and or selling off any assets to help the company survive in the short term. Now you would expect that when a company goes bankrupt and might be forced to lay off many of its employees that make between $50,000 and $100,000 a year, then that company would pinch every penny in order to help keep the company alive. That way they could try to avoid essentially being bailed out by the banks and the public taxpayers. But in the case of Whiting, the exact opposite thing happened because its top executives were given bonuses of just under $3 million each right before the company declared bankruptcy. Now, I am not someone who cares how much money someone makes. If executives deserve to make hundreds of millions of dollars per year, then that's just fine by me. But when your company is on the brink of insolvency and is about to be bailed out by the banks and the government, and when potentially over 100 of your employees are at risk of being laid off, then you probably shouldn't be giving out millions of dollars in bonuses to the top executives. And that money should be going towards things that could help the company survive. Now the counter argument to this is that companies want to try their best to keep executives that know how to run the company. Because the alternative option, which is hiring new executives, could hurt the company and prevent it from getting out of its poor economic situation in the shortest amount of time. But the reason why they give out these bonuses right before the company goes bankrupt, the courts have more say into how much compensation an executive can receive, or even if they should receive anything at all. Essentially, these bonuses are a way to circumvent bankruptcy laws and prevent the company from losing its executives, who in many cases were part of the leadership that led to the company's bankruptcy in the first place. Now, the trouble is that this is just one example of companies that are going bankrupt while trying to hand out millions of dollars to their top executives right before declaring bankruptcy. Extraction Oil and Gas, for example, is dishing out just under $7 million to its executives. Chesapeake Energy dished out $25 million. California Resources restructured its compensation to its CEO, so he would receive double his annual salary and bonuses if he were to be let go. And by the way, he made $10.5 million last year alone. And just keep in mind that all of these companies are either declaring bankruptcy or are on the brink of going bankrupt. And these examples of millions of dollars in bonuses being given out to executives executives at failing oil companies don't just apply to oil companies. I mean, Macy's rolled out $9 million to a handful of executives, despite laying off 3,900 employees. Neiman Marcus, who recently filed for bankruptcy, wants to dish out $10 million to its top executives. JC Penney dished out $10 million in bonuses, with half of that going to the CEO. And in fact, out of the 45 largest companies that recently declared bankruptcy, Roughly two thirds of them paid out millions of dollars in additional executive bonuses within six months of their bankruptcy filing date. Essentially, when these companies fail and thousands of people are laid off, many of the top executives are actually getting bonuses and golden parachutes. And all of these examples really give truth to the saying that the workers get paid when the stock goes up, they get paid less when the stock goes down, and they get laid off when the company goes bankrupt. But for executives, they get paid when the stock goes up, they get paid when the stock goes down, and they get paid when the company goes bankrupt. 
and you'd figure we would have learned our lesson from the 2008 financial crisis. You see, in 2008, after the bank bailouts, roughly $30 billion of taxpayer money, which is largely from the middle class, went solely to executive bonuses just at these Wall Street banks and nowhere else. For example, Citigroup gave 738 $1 million bonuses or more to its executives after receiving a $45 billion bailout. And AIG gave roughly $1.6 billion to executives after receiving its bailout money. And just to put that into perspective, the entire federal tax payment of 4.3 million average American households for the year 2009 went solely to the executive bonuses at these Wall Street banks. So now it is worth mentioning that the 2009 bailout money was largely taxpayer money. Meanwhile, today, a lot of the bankruptcies and executive compensation isn't coming directly from public funds. But that doesn't mean we aren't seeing something similar today. I mean, this year in 2020, we have already seen hundreds of millions of dollars being sent out to executives just a few weeks before their companies declare bankruptcy. And as mentioned in a previous video of mine, the spike in bankruptcies from this poor economy have only just begun. And another troubling thing is that the executive compensation isn't the only way that large corporations and executives are raking in the cash while the average person struggles. For example, the $650 billion Paycheck Protection Program, also known as the PPP, was supposed to be a way for small businesses to receive up to $10 million on a two-year 1% interest rate loan. And this loan would actually be forgivable, meaning that the principal wouldn't have to be paid back as long as all employees at these companies kept their jobs and at least 60% of these funds went to the employees, with the majority of the rest of these funds being used for things like rent and utilities for the company. So the PPP was pretty much a bailout that was solely intended for small businesses of Main Street, not for big businesses of Wall Street. Yet what we have seen so far is that some giant corporations are finding loopholes in this program in order to get a disproportionate amount of government money, even if they don't need it. I mean, almost immediately after the PPP began to be distributed, large corporations like Ruth's Chris Steakhouse and even the Los Angeles Lakers tried to get this loan. And then there are other companies like Vibra Healthcare, who have over 9,000 employees and made over $1 billion last year alone, who were successfully able to receive $97 million from the Paycheck Protection Program. And they did this by having 23 smaller LLCs that were able to act as if they weren't a large company, even if they were essentially just a branch of this billion dollar corporation. There was also a massive casino operator called Maverick Gaming that did the same thing with 20 LLCs and received tens of millions of dollars, despite the company being valued at over $1 billion. There was also two nursing home chains that had a total of over 70 LLCs that received money from the PPP as well. In fact, there are over a dozen other cases of companies with valuations of about a billion dollars that were able to receive money as if they were a small business. Now, I would just like to say that there is a counterpoint about how there are some gray areas for this program. For example, in the restaurant business, it is commonplace for a franchisee of let's just say a Pizza Hut to have a majority stake in its location. Meaning that even though this one Pizza Hut is technically a part of the parent company, it is also a separate entity that has little to no daily financial dealings with the parent company. But what if the parent company of Pizza Hut were to own, let's say, a 50% stake in one location? Does this mean that this one location is technically under ownership of the billion dollar brand? Or is it still a small business owned by a franchisee? As you can see, this is a gray area. But when you consider that many struggling small businesses were turned down from the PPP for reasons like they're being too new of a company, or they weren't partnered with a bank, or even they needed too small of a loan, then there should definitely be some serious questions about how this money's being distributed. And I mean, for example, there are members of Congress, multimillionaires like Kanye West and Judd Apatow, and even the Church of Scientology, who were all able to get loans with no questions asked. And the problem is, is that there's only so much money to go around. For example, most parts of California only had a PPP approval rate of about 25% in the first round of PPP loans. But depending on where you live, the approval rating could be as high as 90% like some parts of Alabama. 
all this means is that it is quite possible that large corporations may have taken out a loan that could have gone out to potentially dozens of other small businesses that may have needed that loan more than those corporations. Now, I would just like to mention that most of the millions of businesses that were able to receive PPP loans have used it for its intended purpose and were generally small to medium-sized businesses that did use it for payroll. But you can't help but see how many people and businesses who likely don't need these loans are still to this day taking advantage of the program. And by the way, I didn't even mention the controversy surrounding the thousands of churches that don't have to pay taxes, yet are taking on between one to three billion dollars worth of PPP loans right now, which is ironically taxpayer money. And lastly, a giant elephant in the room that I had talked about in March is the airlines. You see, in March, with the current information I had at hand, I understood why it was reasonable to bail out the airlines. Because personally, I don't think it's right for the government to cut down an entire industry's revenue by 95% or more without expecting some sort of financial assistance for the companies. And I still do kind of believe that. But what I didn't know at the time was how poorly these airline companies were prepared for any sort of downturn in the economy, let alone an entire lockdown. You see, I knew that American Airlines had done very well as a company over the past decade or so. I mean, since 2012, American Airlines has raked in an operating income totaling over $25 billion. Yet, right before the pandemic hit, they only had a few billion dollars of cash on hand, meaning that if they had a bad year like they had in 2008, then they likely would not have been able to survive without filing for bankruptcy or receiving a bailout. And all this means is that most airlines had the opportunity to prepare for a downturn in the economy, but instead they spent roughly half of their profits during the good times of the past 12 years on $12 billion worth of stock buybacks. Now I should say that American Airlines was by far the worst offender of this, and many of the other airlines had a much lesser quantity of buybacks, but nonetheless, the fact that an airline who could have had an additional $12 billion in cash on hand to help prepare for any downturn in an economy, and yet chose to buy back their own stock instead, probably doesn't deserve the amount of financial assistance that they are getting today. But in Italy, they had a similar ordeal, but they went about their business in a different fashion. You see, instead of giving the airline the gift of essentially free taxpayer money, the government of Italy just bought out ownership of the airline to keep it afloat. So the Italian airline, Alitalia, is now essentially a public utility of the taxpayer. Now I understand there's a whole debate about if it's better for the government to run a company versus keeping a company under private control. But in this specific case in Italy, it was just an example of taxpayers actually getting bang for their buck in regards to bailing out a company in need. And so now that we've mentioned all of this, how executives are getting compensation right before bankruptcies, how large corporations are somehow getting tens of millions of dollars in loans each, and how some large corporations were financially irresponsible, yet are getting bailed out again by the taxpayer, I would like to ask you guys this question. What do you guys think of these three scenarios? Should executives be able to get these bonuses before bankruptcies? Do you think it's right that large corporations have smaller branches that are able to get large loans? And what do you think of the airline bailouts? I'd like to know your thoughts in the comments down below. And please hit that notification bell if you want to see my next video, which will be out very soon. So stay tuned for that and please subscribe and leave a like because that would mean a ton to me and because it helps out with the algorithm and I love you guys a lot. But for now, please check out my documentaries playlist, which has a bunch of other videos just like this on there. So please click on that playlist or my next video and I will see you guys there in just a few seconds.